Can you beat Final Fantasy VII using a class system? Short answer, yes. Of course you can. People have beaten this game using attack only, items only, one character only. So I am not claiming that this is a particularly hard challenge run, but long term viewers of my channel know that these challenge run series are all about the journey and finding a new way to play the game that makes it feel fresh and also rediscovering what makes this game so special. Final Fantasy VII is one of the most beloved in the series and I hope through my videos you get to rediscover what makes this game so special as I'll be creating critiquing the story and poking a bit of fun at some of the silliness that this game has but is mostly a love letter to Final Fantasy. Huh? I hope you stick around and enjoy the ride because this game is crazy and I had a lot of fun playing this game. Before we get started though I want to give a quick shout out to a YouTuber under the name of Necroll. He initially coined this idea in a video I will post on screen and in a link in the description. I took his idea as inspiration and have adapted some of the classes he presents into my own. Go subscribe to Netcrawl, check out his videos, they're all very very well made and he deserves a lot more recognition than he has at the moment. Now that that's out of the way I'm going to go through each character and show you guys how I have come up with each class and what I have named them. So starting with our main character, Cloud. So I've chosen to keep the name the same that Necroll chose for Cloud in calling him a Mystic Knight. And what this basically means for my challenge is it is a strength based character that also specializes in black magic and mainly the elemental materia. So the green materia that Cloud can equip is fire, ice and lightning as well as contain which gives him some late game magical potential. Throughout the story you can pick up free elemental materia and Cloud can equip all three of them meaning he can protect against fire, ice and lightning as well as equip it to his sword so he can also deal physical elemental damage which is pretty cool. Each character is going to have two red materia each that has two summon materia. The two I've chosen for Cloud is Alexander and Neo Bahamut. Alexander actually has the holy element attached to him so when equipped with the elemental materia he can either deal holy damage or protect against it and Neo Bahamut just because it's a pretty cool summon that feels very fitting for Cloud. He has absolutely no yellow materia and the only purple materia he can equip are things like chocobo lure, enemy lure and enemy away as he will always be in your party so it makes sense that he can equip these. He also has the added cut materia which is just a bit of extra utility to give him a bit more fighting power. Cloud will obviously be used throughout the entire journey apart from a small section without him so it's important that he doesn't feel too overpowered but I've given him a few late game stuff such as the added cut and contain materia so that he still feels fresh in the later portions of the game. As you can see there he specializes in high strength and high magic those are going to be his standout stats and he was very very fun to use I will say that. Moving on to our next character and it is none other than Cloud's big boyfriend Barrett and I have named his class the Defender and he specializes in high vitality and high HP so he's all about defense and this shows through his materia as well as he can equip the barrier, shield and heal materia. Barrier and shield provide our allies with higher magic defense and defense so a pretty self explanatory and then heal can just remove any debuffs from us sort of like a synergist from Final Fantasy 13, all about trying to buff our stats and keep us well protected. He also has the all materia so that he can cast his shields on everybody as well as the counter materia for just a bit of extra utility but his purple materia is really what defines him and it's the cover materia in particular that makes him a defender as this allows him to jump in the way of his allies and protect them from any damage and the HP plus materia also means that he can survive more hits and be more of a tank. And then yellow materia he gets the slash all materia which is really good late game utility allowing him to defeat multiple foes at once as well as the W item materia which allows him to use two items at once so that he can heal people more effectively bring them back to life or cure their status ailments. His two summons are Titan and Bahamut. Titan just feels the most fitting for Barrett as he is a big strong Titan and Barrett himself is a big strong dude too. And then Bahamut is also just another big powerful character much like Barrett himself. So yeah Barrett is all about utility, it's all about protecting people and he is usually the last person alive on the field. Very handy character to have around if you are being dealt a lot of damage by the enemy. So really really enjoyed Barrett this run. 
Next up is Yagao Tifa, and I've gone with the Monk class, as she uses her fists in battle. And I wanted to try incorporate some of the classic Final Fantasy jobs in this run, and Monk is obviously the most fitting for Tifa. And as you can see there, she specialises in high strength and high HP, much like the traditional Monk would, and also has the Restore Materia. This is something that the older Final Fantasy games did a lot, you could also heal yourself as a monk, but it doesn't stop there, she also gets the HP Absorb Materia, which is very very handy as it allows her to steal HP from the enemies, making her quite a tough enemy to kill. She also has the HP Plus and the EXP Plus Materia. I don't even think I end up finding the EXP Plus Materia through this run, it was more just there because I wanted to make sure that if we did have it, it would be given to one character, and it just felt the most fitting for Tifa for some reason, I think because she doesn't really have many other materia, so I just wanted to fill it out a bit more. Yellow materia, she gets sense, which is kind of useless, it allows you to look at the details of each enemy, and it's not too hard to know what they are and are not weak against, so I don't even think I use sense, but it felt like a monk ability, so it's there. And then the death blow ability, which when linked to the HP absorb materia, is a very, very powerful bit of tech that makes her a super, super powerful late game character. Tifa also has access to weapons with perfect accuracy, meaning that coupled with the death blow HP absorb materia combination never misses which is incredible, it's very very powerful. In terms of summons, I've given her Shiva, this is like the sexy goddess summon, and Tifa herself is a bit of a sexy goddess, so felt fitting. And then Phoenix just feels like a monk summon to me. And it also has the added utility that it can revive your party members, which just gives her a little bit extra oomph, and gives her more that she can do, so... Yeah, very, very powerful. Really, really, really enjoyed Tifa this run. I feel like I'm going to say that about most characters, but Tifa in particular was one of the most fun for me. Aerith's class was another easy one. She is, of course, going to be a white mage, specialising in magic and spirit. She can equip all of the healing green materia, such as Restore, Revive, Heal, Barrier, Shield, and is the only character that can gain full cure. Yeah, she also gets access to the All Materia, as well as MP+, and Magic+, Plus, but she has no Yellow Materia, and no Red Materia, because something very, very unfortunate happens to her, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't really use Aerith very much in this run. She's just there because she happens to be a character, but we're just going to pretend she doesn't really exist. But when she does exist, these are the materia that she can equip, okay? And of course, Red 13 had to be our Red Mage this run. And he has a lot of materia that he can equip and specialises in very high MP and magic. So the green materia that he can use is Restore, Revive, Heal, Fire, Ice, Lightning and Earth which is very good early game as it means he can heal and dish out a lot of damage, but his late game utility goes down drastically as he doesn't have access to a lot of the powerful late game spells, so his usefulness kind of peters off around halfway through the game, but he is still a very powerful character because of his ability to heal and deal damage. So Red is actually the only character that has access to two all materia, which is great because it means he can restore HP to all of our party members, as well as deal magical damage to all of our enemies. He also has access to magic counter and MP absorb. MP in this game is kind of crazy, a lot of the magic spells end up costing lots and lots of MP, so being able to recover it just means that he can do a bit more. I felt like giving him magic plus would just make him a little bit too overpowered and we also only gain access to one throughout the game so I wanted to give it to a different character. So MP plus still very powerful means he can use more spells but his magic stat won't be mega mega high. Ifrit is an obvious summon for red as he has a fiery tail and is all about being fiery and red and Ifrit is the fire summon so makes a lot of sense right? And then Kajata also makes a lot of sense for Red as it deals a lot of elemental damage which is something that the Red Mage is used to doing. It's also a beast and Red is a beast so Red is a great character in the early game but he does definitely peter off in the late game but still a very handy all round damaging and healing character. He can do everything. Jack of all trades, master of none. We all know the Red Mage, we all love him, he's great. Moving on to our next character which is Yuffie and Yuffie has access to a lot of different materia and of course she is a thief slash ninja slash time mage type character specializing in high dexterity. 
she is all about speed. And the two green material that she can equip is escape and time. Time obviously feels quite ninjury because it is all about speed, adjusting the speed of the enemies as well as increasing her own. She also gains access to all, added effect, sneak attack and steal as well. Steal as well means that she can equip it to one of her summons and steal from multiple enemies which is very handy. Sneak attack is fairly useless, we don't really utilise it very much, but added effect is very powerful when coupled with the Choco Mog materia, which is kind of a bit cheeky and cheesy as a summon, and I feel like Yuffie is a bit cheeky and a bit cheesy, so it all made sense, and that's just like a very cool combo, because added effect with Choco Mog basically means that you can inflict stop on any of our enemies when we just attack, which is very, very handy, and a good bit of tech that just makes her stand out amongst some of these other characters. Purple materia, she's got a lot, she gets speed plus, Gil plus, counter attack and preemptive. These are all fairly obvious, they are all speed related, thief related. Counter attack in particular is very very powerful. Of course yellow materia she has to have steal and throw. These are classic thief ninja abilities so they had to make their way onto Yuffie. And I've already mentioned Choco Mog as one of her summon materials and the other one is Leviathan as it is one of the summons that you gain in Wutai which is like her homeland and has a lot of ties to her backstory so felt very fitting for Yuffie. A very useful character to have but not the strongest to use in just your standard fight. She'll mostly be put into our party when there are powerful items that we want to steal from our enemies but that's Yuffie. Nearly there now guys, there are a lot of characters in this game and our next one is Kate Sif who is a sort of blue mage slash status mage. Think Waka from Final Fantasy X mixed with someone like Quina or Keatsits from Final Fantasy VIII and IX. Basically they specialise in dealing status effects to the enemy but their key materia is the enemy skill materia which is where the blue mage comes into it. They learn lots of techniques from the enemies that they can then use for themselves and it's a very very powerful materia and they're the only one who gains it so Without enemy skill, Kate Sif would be kind of useless. He specialises in high luck and high spirit. I thought that was quite an interesting direction to take Kate Sif. And the green materia that he gets is Seal, Mystify, Poison and Transform. Honestly, Poison is the only one that is actually very effective and useful. The rest of them, they're there just because we need to equip it to someone. But I don't really find much use out of it, to be honest. The only blue materia that Kate Sif can use is the added effect. And he does share this with Yuffie. I thought about just using one added effect materia, but I kind of wanted two characters to gain access to it because I wanted the added effect plus Hades summon, which is a very powerful combination which allows you to inflict multiple status ailments on the enemy just by attacking, which is very very handy and he needs it. Purple materia, he gains luck plus and MP plus. Enemy skills cost a lot of MP to use, so we need that MP plus to ensure that he can actually use them. And then luck plus again feels fitting because his limit break is all about using slots which needs a lot of luck and I don't know luck just feels like a stat that would bide well for Kate Sif. And then the other yellow materia that he can have is manipulate, mime and morph. Manipulate in particular is very very handy as it means that we can use that on the enemies and force them to teach us techniques for our enemy skill materia. Very, very cool stuff. And then I also gave him the Knights of the Round summon materia. I don't know if we will even bother getting the Knights of the Round because it takes a very long time to get that summon. But I just thought it'd be quite funny if our little boy Kate Sif managed to have the most powerful summon in the game. I kind of written him off as just like a bit of a gimmicky character, but he comes in very handy in this run. And I was very, very impressed with him and use him way more than I ever do in any of my other playthroughs. Because let's be honest, whoever wants to play with Kate Sif, he's not a very good character. <laughs> but he is in this run, so that's fun, right? Next up is Vincent, and I've decided to make up my own class for this guy, and I've called it the Dark Mage. And do not confuse it with the Black Mage, because it is quite a bit different. And he specialises in having very, very high magic, the highest in the game. And the green materia that he can equip is Comet, Destruct, Gravity and Ultima. So these are all very, very powerful black magic spells, but they are not elemental magic. It just feels like darkness, you know, it's all of the big, scary, evil magic that he can use. And that's very fitting for his character and look and personality and stats. Blue materia, he gets MP Turbo and MP Absorb. He does share the MP Absorb materia with red, but you kind of need it for those characters just because of how much MP is used when you are using 
using these techniques. So yeah, MP Absorb was a must. And then Purple Materia, he doesn't get the MP plus Materia, but he does get Magic plus. So he can just do a lot, a lot of damage with his magic. And then Yellow Materia, he gets the W Magic, which allows him to cast two spells at once. He gets Ramu, which feels kind of fitting to Vincent as it's like a powerful wizard and Vincent is a powerful wizard himself. And then Odin feels very fitting because it's all about darkness and evil. And the special ability that is attached to Odin is death, something that Vincent specializes in with this setup. We first get Vincent, he's kind of useless because we don't really have any of these things. I think all we have really is Ramu. But once we get into the late stages of the game, he is again one of the most powerful ones just because of the powerful spells that he can use. He ends up being like the best damage dealer that we have in terms of magic anyway. So really, really love Vincent. Really love the idea of a dark mage instead of a black mage. It's very cool, very fun. We love it. Let's move on to our final character now, which is Sid. And I'll be honest, I was kind of running out of material at this point. So I've said that Sid is a kind of dragoon summoner, specializing in high strength, and he gets access to no green material at all. He is not a magic based character. He gets final attack, which means when he dies, he can use one of his powerful summons. He gets the long range materia, which is very good. It means he can sit in the back row and deal damage and also gets access to double cut, which is very, very strong. It means he can attack enemies multiple times and just deal a lot of physical damage and also W summon. So he has like two of the more powerful summons in the game, Bahamut Zero and Typhoon. So he can dish out a lot of his damage using these. Yeah, not really much to say about Sid. You can put him in your party when you just want to deal a lot of damage reliably. And having that long range materia just means that he won't die very often. And then even when he does die, the final attack means he can at least dish out a big attack before he goes. So not the most useful, but definitely a very very strong character indeed. So that is everybody and we will be swapping between these characters throughout the journey so that we aren't just using a set party of three. We will keep mixing it up and moving them around so that everybody gets use. And I will be referring back to these charts as we go forward so that you can see the progress of each character and show you their stats and how they're developing and what they can do so you will get a very clear indication of how these characters are doing. That's all the boring stuff out the way. This is Jamsack's Final Fantasy VII Challenge Run video. Let's go! Wow, what a way to open up a game. Seriously, the opening sequence to this game gets me so incredibly hyped. The way it seamlessly transitions from FMV to the in-game graphics is chef's kiss. For 1997, this game is truly, truly groundbreaking. And I'm so excited to play it here on my channel. And I hope you guys are going to enjoy this one because I had a lot of fun revisiting this game. But here we are. This is our first ever battle with our good buddy Cloud, also known as X Soldier. And luckily, he already has Ice and Bolt equipped to him. So here I am just testing out the abilities to see how much damage they do. And it's pretty, pretty powerful. Also, for the first half an hour or so of this video, the game audio is not going to match up with what's happening on screen. I basically lost all of the audio for the footage and had to re-record the run with audio this time. So I've tried to match it up as best as I can. Some sound effects won't match at all, but just bear with, it does correct itself towards the end of the video, so don't worry. And here we meet our main protagonist Cloud, who has teamed up with a radical group named as Avalanche, who are going to blow up a reactor that is sucking all of the energy out of the planet and destroying it. And I honestly forgot about how much of an asshole he was at the beginning of the game. I don't care what your names are, once this job's over, I'm out of here. Like, geez, what is your problem, Cloud? He does definitely develop a lot as this game goes forward, but yeah, at the beginning, he's definitely a major asshole. After picking up Barrett, we then receive the Restore Materia, but of course we cannot equip this Materia yet, as the two characters we have cannot equip these as it does not fit their class. So, we continue forward and go ahead and place the bomb, but not before Cloud has a little freak out, and the game does this a lot. 
You get moments where you get to dive into Cloud Psyche, and it's a very dark and mysterious place. And it brings you out of the world and into a sort of horror fantasy, and I love that this game does this. It really adds to the overall aesthetic and vibe of this game, which they haven't done in a Final Fantasy game in a while, and I love that they do this. It, this game is actually kind of terrifying at times, but yeah. We've now placed the bomb, and it is time for our first boss battle against the Guard Scorpion. Obviously, with this being the first boss of the game, it's not going to be too difficult, and Barrett at the moment has no materia as there is nothing that he can equip himself with, so he is just an attacking machine that could use items. But luckily Cloud has Bolt, and it turns out this guy is weak against Bolt, and a lot of enemies in this game are weak against Bolt, so the fact that we always have Bolt, Ice and Fire on our main character is very handy, it just means we can consistently do good damage, and I really like how they balance the magic spells in this game. The black magic spells in this game will increase over time as you gain AP, and then you can get Bolt 2 and Bolt 3, which cost more MP but deal a lot more damage, so your materia never gets old. You never have to get rid of it for stronger spells, as the spells that you have will increase over time and become stronger. It's also a lot more powerful than using your regular attack, so there's actually a reason to use magic in this game, and also coupled with the all materia means that you can target all enemies, so the balancing of magic in this game, pretty good. Some of the best in the series, I would say. Now, what's cool about this fight is that it actually has a secondary stance, and you're about to see it in a minute. So when this enemy lifts its tail up in the air, it is about to counter-attack. So if you go and attack him while he's in this stance, it will counter-attack for massive damage. So you kind of just want to sit there and do nothing, but this is the perfect time to use some potions. And we love Barrett so much, and even though he doesn't need the health, we give it to him anyway, because, uh... We love him. I'm pretty sure him and Cloud are an item, I just get that vibe straight away. Maybe not in a regular playthrough of this game, but in my playthrough of this game, I feel like these two definitely have the hots for each other, let's just say that. And now the Guard Scorpion's tail is down, we can just continue to use Bolt and attack with Barrett until eventually it dies. It only has 800 HP. This is, of course, like a tutorial boss, just teaching you that, hey, there are bosses in this game and they will do some different stuff to you. I don't really know what this search scope attack does. I feel like that's just him saying, hey, I'm going to target you next, which is very nice. Most other enemies don't do that, they'll just attack you. So at least this guy's friendly enough to tell you that he's going to hurt you. And uh, here comes his scorpion tail, which is going for Cloud, obviously, because he locked on him. But now it is time to use our limit break. And to make this game more challenging, I would have had no limit breaks. But you can't really avoid using limit breaks in this game because they stop you from attacking. So you're kind of forced into using them. But that's okay, because they're all very cool anyway. And uh, obviously we didn't actually get off the limit break, which is quite sad, but we will do soon. Mission successful, we blow up the reactor, and we barely escape with our lives intact, and head onto this train to surprise our boyfriend. And here he is, patiently waiting for us on the train, and it's time to come in and give him a big surprise. Ah. Oh. Everyone is just so happy that I'm here. And I'm happy too, because I get to be with the man I love. Looks like I'm a little late. Cloud is definitely a bit cheeky and a bit annoying at this part of the game, I will be honest. But Barrett doesn't seem to mind. He's uh, he's very kind to us, you know? Ah, when he calls you open bracket asterisk up arrow percentage exclamation point. Well, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me. Honestly, get you a guy who talks to you the way Barrett talks to Cloud, because it's very, very sweet. And uh, he loves to use punctuation. He also loves math, because he's got percentage in there. So he's just a clever, clever, kind boy. And I'm so happy that we get to experience this journey with him. Hearing Tifa's theme after all of these years is so nostalgic to me. I think I first played this game when I was around 10 years old, and everybody talks about Aeris' theme and how iconic that is, but for me, Tifa's theme really does it. And it's such a hard feeling to describe that feeling you get with nostalgia, but honestly, it just fills me with so much joy and happiness to be playing this game again, and I'm just so ready for the journey that we have ahead. So we've picked up this flower from Aerith, and it gives us an option to give it to Tifa or Barrett's daughter Marlene. Oh god, what do I choose? What do I choose? We're gonna give it to Marlene. We are trying to f*** her daddy, so it makes sense to make him as happy as possible, so... You better appreciate this kind gesture, Barrett. I'm, I'm really gonna break my back out in this game to make you happy. Even though you do weird sh like... this. 
Damn, I wish I was that punchy back. Good morning, Cloud. Did you sleep well? Uh, yeah. Barrett's snoring kept me up. If you know what I mean. It's just malicious, just gay f tree that I just was not thinking we were going to run into here. Now that Tifa has joined our party, we can go ahead and purchase the fire materia that we can equip to Cloud, giving him all three of the magical elements, which is perfect. And we can also equip the restore materia to Tifa, so she can now do some healing. And here is a quick little check on everybody's stats. As you can see, Cloud has some pretty high magic and decent strength to go with it. And then moving on to Tifa, her strength is definitely not the strongest, but that will increase over time. And she has a little bit of magic to support. And then Barrett here has got some really decent strength and really decent vitality. So he is slipping into his role quite well. We're about to go blow up the second reactor, but Cloud keeps having these crazy flashbacks. <gasps> Are you all right, Tofu? Mmm. Okay, so we got this puzzle here where we all have to press the button at the same time. And I don't mean to flex, but I literally got it on the first try. So what does that say about me? God gamer, I guess. Unfortunately, we were caught by the president of the Shinra company, who is the company responsible for sucking all of the juice out of the planet and destroying it. And they've decided to try and kill us with this giant robot. And there's a lot of giant robots in this game. And this one is called the Airbuster. Luckily, I had Barrett's uh, limit break ready on hand and he gets to use big shot while his back is turned which does huge damage almost 700 which that's like half of his hp already gone whenever he has his back to us we deal more damage and we are getting pretty lucky here as he keeps having his back to us i don't think it seems to work though for magic it might only be when you attack them but either way bolt is our best bet still and you can see there 144 damage from tofu no nope. i mean tifa <laughs> why'd i say tofu that's definitely not her name. I don't know what was that guys and I didn't do that. But now Tifa has her limit break and it's probably my favorite in the entire game. As you level up and gain more limit breaks it adds to her collection so instead of having to equip only a few limit breaks she gets to use all of hers at once and you have like a slot machine I usually just mash the X button and hope for the best and you get to unleash a bunch of powerful attacks on the enemy and it's very, very cool. Very fitting for the monk class as well. It's very similar to Zell's from Final Fantasy VIII, but somehow even more cool. I don't know. I just really like collecting all of her limit breaks and being able to unload them all at once, especially as her strength stat increases. This becomes a super, super powerful limit break. And now Cloud has his limit breaks. So you're getting to see everybody here. Not quite sure why Cloud isn't doing very much damage, even though the back was turned and Bolt didn't do very much either. Either way, that was a very easy fight, but nice to show off some of our limit breaks. And you get to see where our levels are at. Tifa is obviously still the weakest, but Cloud and Barrett are up there at level 9. Oh god, the airbuster blew up and has left Cloud hanging by a thread. How is he going to get out of this mess? It is up to Barrett now to keep Tifa safe and there is nothing that can be done. And Tifa still has so much she wants to say to Cloud. He can't die here, but unfortunately the reactor blows up and Cloud falls to his death, ending the game. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name's been Jamsack. This has been my Final Fantasy VII Challenge Run video. See you guys next time. Just kidding. We do actually land at the bottom of this hole and hear a very mysterious voice calling out to us. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hi. Unfortunately, it is not RuPaul at the bottom of this hole. It is none other than this random ass flower girl. And she opts to join our party as she is under attack from Shinra. So we go ahead and give her the restore and all materia. And the only way we can escape is by jumping over this platform here. And Cloud does it with ease, but now it is Aerith's turn. But instead of jumping, she decides to do a lovely little pencil roll down the hill, which uh, is not very helpful at all. Steve! Cloud, help me! Don't you worry, Steve, I've got this! Oh. <laughs> uh, this game's funny.
This game is very, very funny and silly at times, and I do very much appreciate it. But here's Steve in battle, and Steve is one of our weaker characters. Of course, she is our white mage, so it makes sense that she wouldn't be very strong, but luckily the enemies here are not too tough, and we can just whack them with our big old stick. And now that we have got Steve back in our party, we can jump out of the church and transform ourselves into giants! Yes, look at that. Look at the size of us here. The perspective in this game is kind of ridiculous sometimes, but they're using pre-rendered backgrounds, they're just like paintings that they've digitally put characters onto, so uh, yeah, it, it, it just adds to the vibe for me. Uh, some people may find it distracting and it's very of its time, but I think it's very, very charming. So now it's time to escort Steve back home, but unfortunately this guy had been done R sick, but now he just is sick, so that's okay, I guess he was R sick, but now he just is sick, and that's fine, we can deal with that, that's fine, okay, it's fine, it's great. We make sure to pick up the cover material, so now Barrett can actually be a defender, before dropping Steve back back in her home. Is Sector 7 far from here? I want to go to Tofu's bar. I mean, that does sound delicious. I would also like to go to a Tofu bar, to be honest. Is Tofu a girl? Obviously not, Steve. It's a delicious meat replacement made of soy. You big dum-dum. Well, I don't know. Getting help from a girl. I mean, jeez, Cloud, did you not see her beat up those guys with her stick? Sexist much. I know it's 1997, but come on. Okay, now we've got a very iconic monster in this game. It's the Hell Bomber House thing, and Midgar is crazy, and the enemy designs in this game are absolutely insane. The most wild in the whole series. You've got a really weird hybrid of, like, machines and animals and technology, and it's definitely unique. I don't know any other game like it. And I'm going to talk more about Midgar later, as I think it's just a very, very iconic city. It took this sort of post-apocalyptic, you know, steampunk-esque city and twists that motif into something very unique. And this place just feels so drab, so dark and gloomy and scary, but also very vibrant and alive at the same time. And it's very, very special. I have a lot of great feelings about Midgar. It just brings me back so many happy memories. And this Hell Bomber character enemy thing is kind of a perfect example of just the twisted reality that this game creates. And we do manage to kill it. It's very powerful, but we get the job done fairly easily. So we finally reach the stage in the game where Cloud has to dress up in drag to get into this sleazy mansion and save Tifa. And now I think it is the perfect time to talk about why this game is so important and why it was so revolutionary at the time. I think I've come to the conclusion that this game feels like a love letter towards alternative culture. Every single character feels like they fit on the fringes of society and instead of our heroes being noble knights that have come from, you know, glory and are there to save their country, we have these group of misfits. Alternative cultures and people that go against the regular binaries of living is referenced throughout this entire game. You've got Cloud dressing up here in drag. You've also got someone like Vincent who feels very goth or emo aesthetic. You've got somebody like Barrett who actually has a disability as he is missing an arm. And because this world is so corrupt and scary, he has decided to have a gun installed instead. You've got Red 13 who is obviously a furry. It's definitely just a guy dressed up in a fursuit, we all know it. And then Kate Sif as well could also be considered a furry. So doing a lot for the drag, furry and disability community, I suppose, is where I'm going with this. I don't know. Tifa has definitely had some enhancements done, let's just say that. And even Aerith, somebody who is supposed to be the classic white mage, she is dressed a little bit more edgy, you know? She's got some cool, crazy hair and she doesn't look as soft and delicate as the other white mages. And I think that's why this game is just so impactful is because every character in this game feels a little bit strange. And by strange, I don't mean like a bad way. I mean more so they're just not regular folk. Midgar itself is a massive representation of that. Everybody you meet in Midgar is kind of sleazy, drunk or on drugs, or is just like a bit grimy and gross. There is a lot of references to sex, as well as sex work and homosexuality. So I feel like this game just really dared to go outside of the box and talk about issues and reference things that aren't typically referenced in pop popular culture. And that's why I think this game is so successful and so appealing even to this day. So while Cloud spies on this old couple who have accidentally rented a room out in a brothel, I'm going to ask you guys to please like, comment and subscribe. It really helps the algorithm and incentivizes me to keep going on this journey. 
I really love making these series and I want to make sure they are bigger and better every time I make them, so all the love that you guys can give me would be very very much appreciated. And if you can afford it, you can also leave a tip on YouTube using the thanks button. And if you are really, really, really enjoying my content, then you can actually become a member where you can gain access to exclusive behind the scenes content, early access to my videos, as well as priority replies to all comments and a shout out at the end of every video. Now all the boring YouTube stuff is out the way and this old couple has uh, uh, discovered where they are, maybe. Um, let's continue on with the run. Cloud is really getting into character before he gets in drag and decides to uh, relieve this guy of his pressure and um, uh, <laughs> this game basically um, suggests that Cloud passes out and then has intercourse with this large gentleman which is kind of kind of creepy actually and uh, Cloud's reaction to this happening while he's passed out is a uh, just a little, just a little shrug, oh, man. <laughs> and he just continues the journey. So, um, let's get out of this place. Honestly, this section of the game is very bizarre. Okay, the time has come. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, put your hands together for the one, the only, Miss Cloud. <laughs> wow, isn't she beautiful? Hi, ladies. <laughs> Do you trust me? Yes. Thanks, Miss Steve. Now that we have both Steve and Tifa in our party, it's time to fiddle around with their equipment and give them all the material that they deserve so everybody is fitting into their roles quite nicely. You can see Tifa's strength is getting a bit better and you can also see that although Steve is a lot lower level than the other two characters, her magic stat is still very high. But now the time has come for Don Corneo to pick his bride-to-be and oh god the suspense is killing me, who's it gonna be? Will he go for Steve, Tifa or the ever beautiful Miss Cloud? And of course there is no competition because Miss Cloud is the most stunning queen to have ever existed in all of Midgar so of course he chooses her which is fabulous. If you go around the back of Don Corneo's bed, you can pick up a Hyper, which I guess is supposed to be like Viagra. It's very, very funny. Like this game has a very subtle sense of humor to it. And uh, I do find it quite hilarious. It's equal parts creepy, epic, and funny all at the same time. And uh, it's just a very unique experience. Let's just say that. But now it's time for the big reveal. Pause for the big reveal. I'm a man. <laughs> Now that the jig is up, it's time to squeeze some information out of Corneo, and we do so by threatening to chop off his or even rip it off. And uh, yeah, this 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 is a very strange game. I can't tell if he's into this or not. Either way, he does give up some information and reveals that Shinra is actually planning to ambush Avalanche and destroy their base and everybody who lives in that sector of the slums. So we need to get back to Barrett and warn everybody. But unfortunately, Corneo traps us and sends us all the way down into the sewers. And just when we think the worst is over, we start to hear this very strange noise. And it turns out that we are about to be ambushed by a big scary dude named Apps. And Apps is one of the tougher enemies in the early portions of the game. He has 1800 HP, which is a sizable amount compared to the other bosses we fought thus far. And he also has this attack here, Tsunami, which I thought did more damage than it does, but it barely does anything to us. And we have Healing Wind from Steve to get our HP back up. And also Tsunami attacks Apps himself. So that was the big attack that I was scared of. And now that it's happened, I'm like, okay, I'm not scared at all. You can see there Tifa is barely doing any damage to Apps, 39 was pretty weak but she will get very strong soon I promise. Uh, she just starts off with very low HP but we give her a massive boost throughout the game to make sure that she feels much more like a monk does. But Cloud is definitely the MVP at the moment, he's got a super high MP stat, very high magic, high strength, he just does everything, you know. It's a shame that our girls are just not, you know, very strong at the moment. Steve in particular is very weak but Steve's role is simply to heal us so we don't need her to be too strong and uh, Tifa needs a lot of work to get to where we want her 
But once she gets there, she will become a very, very powerful lady indeed. And I can't wait for you guys to see it because uh, her growth is incredible for this great game. I will say that. Fire seems to be the most damaging spell at the moment, so we are just spamming that with Cloud. And it's a shame we don't have Elemental yet so that we could attach it to our weapon. And then Tsunami comes out from the other side this time, and that deals more damage to us. But luckily we are just whacking out these limit breaks like it is nobody's business and dealing tons of damage. Bravery you can see there is barely doing as much damage as Fire does, which is kind of crazy. And we actually happen to get a yeah on Beat Rush, which is really good. And it does about 100 damage, which, uh, you know, it's not bad. It's all extra damage to this guy's massive HP pool. And uh, we do get him down without much trouble at all. And that was a pretty cool fight. You got to see everybody's limit break, which is nice. And Steve here is on a very awkward amount of experience there. He had one point left. So luckily we get him over that barrier into the next level. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe we can get him to level up twice. And uh, no, we're actually two points off. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine. We then pick up the steel materia, which again, we cannot equip yet until we have Yuffie. So it is just sat in our inventory until we get her. Now, here we are in the train graveyard, and I just wanted to show you what a random battle looks like. We're all feeling pretty darn strong, and it's mostly due to Cloud's magic abilities. Fire is just dealing a ton of damage. I believe these ghosts are weak against it. So I'm using Cloud to get rid of the ghost with fire, and then the girls are simply there to attack this flying dude and then cure coming out from steve you can see is doing a good amount of healing damage there is a uh, no threat of us dying let's just say that and yeah that is what a typical fight looks like we're rather strong at the moment and feeling pretty good about our adventure we finally made it back to save barrett and his gang and he's so happy to see us and now we can finally equip him with the cover materia so Barrett has finally fit into his defender role and can start defending us in battle, which is perfect. And looking at his stats here, he's easily the strongest physical damaging dealing character we have and also has a super high vitality stat, which is incredible. He's definitely already in his role very quickly. So now it is time to defeat Reno. And this is not a particularly hard fight. He only has a thousand HP, which compared to apps with its 1800, should be a cakewalk, right? He does this pyramid attack, which uh, traps one of your party members, stopping them from performing any moves. But luckily, all you need to do is punch the pyramid until it breaks, and you can start attacking again. So it's really not that big of an issue. I imagine if it's your first time playing this game, the pyramid might have got you stumped and you'd be like, oh my god, now my characters are useless, what do I do? And I guess this is the game's way of showing you that actually you can attack your own party members and that might be useful in certain battles. So I feel like the Midgar stage of this game is all about preparing you for the rest of the game and slowly introducing mechanics without actually explicitly telling you what to do. And it, it just feels like second nature to me, it just feels obvious that you would attack the pyramid. But maybe it wasn't obvious the first time you would play this game, so I don't know, this game is very cool. It does a lot with the very limited hardware that it was made on. And I just think that it's incredible. I've been singing this game's praises the entire time. I'm just shocked at how fun it was. Because <laughs> I remember liking this game as a kid, but I didn't realise it was this good. And I keep going back to when it was made and just how uh, impactful it was. I will say, as much as I love Final Fantasy X, it is definitely my favourite. Just because of the uh, how much it means to me and how much I used to play it as a kid. But if I am being objective, I will probably say that Final Fantasy VII is the best Final Fantasy game. There's a reason it is so popular, and it's just the characters and the story are so compelling. The battle system is easy enough, but still has some complexity to it. The limit break system is awesome. The world that is created is phenomenal. It really stood the test of time and kind of blurred the lines between like cinema and video game and just did a lot for video games as a whole and uh, it's just a very important piece of history. So I'm glad I get to play it again for you guys here. That was the fight with Reno. Sorry I didn't talk about it too much, but like, what did you wanna know, you know? We, we attacked him until he died. And now we can move on with the story. Barrett's telling me to shut my hole, but I know he's just playing hard to get. My hole will always be open for you, Barrett. Don't you worry. Disgusting! So Steve has been captured by Shinra and is being transported to their headquarters. So the only option we have now is to straddle our boyfriend and fly away as the pillar behind us explodes, destroying Sector 7 and everybody in it. 
What follows is a very emotional scene where Barrett realises that everybody in his team is now dead, including his daughter Marlene. Or so he thinks. Turns out Steve has actually saved Marlene and taken her back to her parents' house. But even still, this is a very big moment where we get to see the repercussions of Barrett's actions. Everything he has worked towards, everything he knows and loves has now been destroyed because of Shinra. It's a way of establishing power in this game. We now know that Shinra are not going to go down lightly. They are something to be feared and this is not going to be an easy job to save the planet. For most people, this would be a sign to just stop and throw in the towel as it is clear that we are dealing with too big an enemy. But for Barrett, this only pushes him to go further in his journey and avenge the deaths of his friends. And I really, really love Barrett's character. He's a very, very strong character who stands up for what he believes in and fights for the cause no matter what. We also pick up the sense materia here, which is kind of useless, but hey, it's cool we got it. And we can immediately equip that to Tifa since she is in our party. And she's now starting to get a bit more monkish, which is lovely. So I guess it's time to break the bad news to Steve's mother about Steve being captured by Shinra. And we learn here that Steve's mother is not actually her real mother. And the reason Shinra are so interested in Steve and keep following her around and capturing her is because she happens to be the last of a race of people known as the Ancients that hold the secrets to the promised land. Something that is a big secret amongst humans that we cannot yet understand. So she holds a lot of knowledge and power and Shinra want to obviously control and harness that, hence why she is such an important character in this world. Okay, that was a lot of story stuff, so let's get on with some gameplay here. Apologies this episode is so long, I want to make sure we get out of Midgar by the end of this episode. So that is why the long runtime, and I don't want to skip over too much. I want to make sure I'm showing you enough story stuff, making it a little bit entertaining, and also showing you some strategy and gameplay stuff, because that's what you're here for, right? You're here to see how these characters develop and grow. This is one of the tougher fights in this area, mainly because there are just a lot of enemies on screen, and we don't have a character that can equip the all materia yet. Usually you would just equip fire to an all materia and burn all these enemies at once, but we can't do that. So we have to defeat them all individually and they don't die in one hit either. So it's a little bit challenging, but hey, that makes it a bit more fun. As you can see there, Barrett is doing his job in protecting people. He can also sit in the back row, which means he takes less damage in general. So he is just like the perfect tank character, really. There is a uh, nobody who does it quite like Barrett. Really, really nice little fight there, showing off some of our power and how everybody is fitting into our roles. And we've also gained Cross Slash, which is Cloud's second limit break, which is awesome. Now, I'm aware that we're about to get red in our party, so I need to buy the necessary materia for him, but we need to buy quite a lot, and Gil is becoming an issue. Usually in this game, you would just buy one of each materia, or maybe three, and you can just swap it out as you swap your party out. But in this version of the game, each character is keeping the materia that they have, we're not swapping them out. So I want to make sure Red has his own set of magic materia and doesn't have to borrow from anybody else. We need to sneak into the Shinra building, but how do we do this discreetly without drawing attention to ourselves? Um, well that went well, I think. You can actually choose to climb the stairs and avoid all of this, but it's way more fun to just burst through the front doors. And you also get some special items and puzzles and fun things like that. So it's much better to just break in than it is to take the boring route and climb these stairs. So that's what we're doing. We're just going straight head first into the middle of the action and making a statement, ready to come and save Steve. Our first challenge is to tackle this mini game where we have to cross these guards. Every time they are walking, we can run to the next station and avoid being captured. And this seems simple enough, but you have to do this for every single character. And turns out I'm really, really bad at this mini game. This game has a lot of mini games and they're all pretty fun, to be honest. Even this, as bad as I was at it, I'm not mad at it because it is quite fun. As you can see here on my first attempt, I do get caught and you have this pretty difficult fight where you are fought from both sides and it's rather challenging and as soon as you finish that fight, you're escorted back to this door and you get to try again and as you can see here on my second attempt, I get caught. So third attempt now, feeling pretty good and nope, we get caught. But finally on my fourth attempt, we make it through the minigame. 
I'm terrible at that. But I'm not terrible at this mini game. You have to work out this password by finding the book that doesn't belong in the library, and the internet won't actually tell you the answer because it's different for every game. But hey, I get mine on the first try, which is awesome. And also means that we receive the elemental materia. So it was very, very vital that I got this right, as there are only three elemental materia throughout the whole game. And this is one of them. And now we can equip it to Cloud and he can start doing the Mystic Knight things. What the f is that? I know I ain't crazy. Here we go again with the creepy stuff. Now this game is really starting to ramp up on the horror aspect and this sh really terrified me as a kid. Seeing this alien body with no head was like, what the hell is that? But we now receive the poison materia, which of course none of us can equip yet until we have Kate Sif. So now it's time to save Steve. Steve. Oh, is that her name? Yeah, her name's Steve. And what, you never met a girl called Steve before? We managed to release Red and Steve from their prison and I'm entrusting my boyfriend to look after Steve while we defeat Hojo so now it is time to finally use our Red Mage. But of course we cannot equip him with the materia just yet so this battle he does have the sense materia which he is not allowed to use but after that we will be equipping him with the appropriate materia. Hojo isn't too difficult or I guess it's not Hojo it's like his weird specimen that has come to kill us. And it's not too difficult a fight, it only has a thousand HP, but it is made a little bit more difficult with the fact that it can poison us, and also that it has these little minions. And you could waste your time trying to kill all the minions, but they will just respawn again, as I soon find out. This guy is also weak to poison, which is why it gave us the poison materia beforehand. But of course we cannot use it yet because we don't have Kate Sif. And yeah, you can see there, Red already comes equipped with Fire and All Materia, which is the first time we've been able to use all this uh, run, which is really nice. Great to use that on all of the enemies, but it is kind of useless because the, uh, the little dude just gets respawned again. So pretend they're not even there, the little dudes don't exist. We just need to focus all of our damage on Mr. Man in the back. And we're using fire from both Cloud and Red to get the job done. And then Tifa is just there to heal us up and punch them whenever she needs to. And luckily Cloud, I think he has the star pendant on so he cannot be poisoned at the moment, which is great. I tried to give all of the accessories that increase our stats to our other characters and give Cloud the more status protection accessories. Since he's in our party the whole time, I want to make sure that the properly strength focused and magic focused characters are getting the accessories that boost their strength and magic. And since Cloud is always going to be a few levels above everyone else because we can't switch him out, I don't want to bombard him with added stats that he doesn't really need because he's already strong enough, you know, let's be real. This fight is one of the more challenging ones simply just due to how many there are on screen. I could have used some antidotes to get rid of the poison but I didn't think it was necessary. I knew I could survive and it just wastes a turn. So yeah, eventually the specimen does go down and we get some lovely EXP points and we now have Red in our party. And Red is a very cool character, one of my favorites. He's just uh, super, super cute. Oh, and we also learned Somersault, which is great. We now have a level two limit break for Tifa. Now it's time to sort out Red's materia and we've got a lot we need to give him. He needs to get Restore, Lightning, Ice, Fire and all. And luckily we just about have enough materia slots to give him everything that he needs and he can now start becoming our Red Mage. And as you can see he definitely has the highest magic of anyone. 34 is absolutely insane at this point but it has of course come at a cost of reducing his HP and strength so he can't do very good in the physical department but that's okay he's mainly just going to be dealing magic damage and he's even surpassed cloud which is awesome we then pick up what i think is the best materia in the game the enemy skill materia but we have to wait till we have kate sif till we can use that and then we get caught by the turks and thrown into a jail cell where we have a mini freak out while barrett and red are having a deep and meaningful chat about the planet and why they fight and who they are and uh cloud is just sat there going ah! Genova's body has been removed from the Shinra headquarters and all that remains is a trail of blood that coats the entire building. 
We have been freed from our prison, but we cannot celebrate yet, as there is clearly something very spooky happening. Everybody around us appears to be dead, including the president of Shinra himself, and all that is left on his corpse is a giant sword sticking out of his back, which belongs to none other than... At this point, we know very little of who Sephiroth is, other than that he used to be a first-class soldier. As if we didn't have enough problems with Shinra, we now have an even bigger enemy on our hands. And I hope you guys are ready for what is potentially the most iconic villain in all of video game history. And they've set it up perfectly in this game. It's very, very clear that this guy is a huge threat. I'm scared. There's a new president now of Shinra and we gotta introduce ourselves. We got Claude, the ex-soldier, first class, Bart from Avalanche. We also got Tofu, who is me too. Me too! Uh, Steve, the flower girl, and none other than Green, our research specimen. <laughs> what a crew indeed, that is correct. So our party splits up into two and we have this fight here with Steve, Bart and Green. Because if it ain't green, huh, I'm not interested, okay? Against this machine in an elevator. And what's cool about this fight is that we cannot use any close range attacks. Simply because our enemy is of course on the other side of the elevator shaft. So again, it is introducing us to another new mechanic. Every single boss battle we've had thus far has added some different sort of element to it that makes it a little bit more challenging than the regular fights, other than just having a higher HP pool than the regular fights. You know what I mean? There's something that differentiates it and uh, forces you to use the game mechanics in a different way. So luckily Bart can do long range damage with his Gatling gun, which is always very handy. Red cannot do physical attacks, but luckily he is a mage anyway, and his magic power is super duper strong. Steve on the other hand cannot do much of anything, so I'm just defending with her until I need to heal. And I'm finally addressing that I've given everybody ridiculous names. I did it with Steve, but I was uh, pretending that Tifa, Cloud and Barrett were still called Tifa, Cloud and Barrett. But they're not. It's Tofu, Clod and Bart. And now Green is here too. And uh, I kind of just gave everyone the first sort of name that came to mind. I didn't really think too hard about it, but I like doing that. It now makes this journey feel a bit more personal, you know? We've got to put our own little stamp on it. And we get to develop the characters how we want to in our run, right? Because we've given them new personalities with this name. Because uh, that's how that works. Anyway, this fight actually is kind of tough. It's got a lot of HP. 1600 is very large. And it doesn't stop there because there is another boss battle immediately after this. So uh, I always remember this fight. It's one of the cooler ones at the beginning of the game. And we are nearing the end of the Midgar section. Which means we're nearing the end of this video. But the Midgar section is very, very monumental in this game. And I love as soon as you leave Midgar, the game just like opens up and becomes an entirely new game. Very, very cool, and uh, probably one of the best introductions in a Final Fantasy game that I can think of, in terms of just like, the world that is created, how big the city feels, and then how you then start to realise that the world you're in is even bigger than this big city you're in. It's a uh, tremendous work. <laughs> we have now destroyed the first of the crazy robots, and we're like, okay, cool, sweet, we did that. But nope, here comes flying robot number two. How long is this elevator? It feels like a... Uh, the background isn't moving at all, but we are, so um, either it's really slow, or this building just goes on forever, who knows. It's also really weird that they are just like off kilter, you'd think if they're both going the same speeds, they would both be at the same level, but like why do they keep going up and down all the time? Who cares, I'm looking way too much into this, like it really does not matter. Uh, you just saw Green's limit break, Sled Fang, yeah, it's okay, Green doesn't get the best limit breaks, and neither does Bart either to be honest. Uh, there is one that Green has where he can recover his MP, which comes in very handy later on. But for now, Sledhammer is a bit meh, you know? Same with uh, Big Shot from Bart. And Mind Blow is also kind of useless. There's a few fights where Mind Blow comes in handy. But aside from that, it's just like, why would you waste your limit break just destroying the enemy's MP when there's so much more you can do, you know? But yeah, this guy is definitely a bit easier than the other guy. Well, I say that. He can cause these horrible status effects. But luckily Bart should have heal, I believe. Uh, actually no, I don't think we have heal yet. So I removed the sleep just by attacking him. And I could use an antidote. But again, it doesn't really feel like poison does all that much damage. So I'm not too bothered. 
And at least Steve now has something to do. She can just constantly hit Bart whenever he falls asleep. And yeah, I take back what I said. This is probably harder than the first battle just due to the status ailments he can inflict on us. But luckily Steve now has her limit break, Bart has his limit break. They charge up very quickly at this early portion of the game because we are still quite low leveled and things do a lot more damage to us. But I feel like later on in the game it becomes much more difficult to build up your limit breaks, which is probably a good thing, it means you can't spam them as much. In these early portions you get to spam away, which is always very very fun, I do appreciate that because uh, some of the more fun parts of the game is just watching the big flashy limit breaks happen. There's some very very cool ones, I will say that. And yeah, that is the spinny whirly helicopter boy down, and we're finally getting towards the end of this section. We then catch up with Claude who has destroyed Rufus, I say destroy, he just had a little battle with him and he flies away on his helicopter. Didn't want to show you all of that fight, nothing much really happens and we gotta get through to the end here. Oh yeah, the gang is back together and it's time to escape the Shinra building, but how are we gonna do that? On none other than Claude's big ass motorbike. Where did he get this motorbike from? I don't know, why is there a car there? Also don't know, but is it really cool and epic and awesome and one of the most bestest cutscenes you may have ever seen in your entire life with the worst graphics in the world but it's still pretty iconic? Yes god damn it, yes it is. And uh, I love this, what a, what a hype scene this is. Everybody looks so cool. <laughs> and what follows is a really cool mini game actually where you're on a motorbike and you have to remove the Shinra soldiers by attacking them with your sword. We get a chance to swap our party around and I'm going with Red, Bart and Claude as these seem to be the most powerful. Tifa isn't ready yet, Steve is fine but Red just does what Steve does as well as having black magic and also Bart can defend us and has really high vitality so we'll come in super handy but yeah Here's the minigame. It's pretty difficult but it's quite cool if you uh, get hit too much then when you're in the next boss battle you will lose the amount of HP that you lost in this minigame, if that makes sense. I suck at it but we managed to not lose that much HP which is pretty good. And now it's time for the final boss of this episode. Thank you guys so much for watching. I know this has been a really long one, but we are nearly at the finish line. And this boss has 2600 HP, so it really is a cut above the rest of the enemies that we've fought thus far. And I know that it always starts with a back attack, so I came prepared. I put Bart in the front row and then Green and Claude in the back row, so that when they're back attacked, they get swapped around and they're in their normal positions again. Pretty clever, right? If you were playing this game blind you wouldn't know that, but I know all the secrets of this game. I am no stranger to this game. I know all the ins and the outs and uh, I'm also using a walkthrough, <laughs> which is telling me a lot of uh, handy information, but I don't rely on it too much. It's just to point me in the right direction and make sure that I don't miss any items because I would hate to miss something important like a summon that we can no longer use or any piece of material that could be key to developing our characters. So yeah, I do actually look at a walkthrough through most of this and it just gives me a nice insight on what to expect. This guy is pretty tough, he's got this twin burner attack which you are seeing on screen and it does a decent chunk of damage to all of us, but I do believe green has cure all which is very nice or restore and all materia equipped which is very good and like most machines in this game they are weak to bolt so you can see there Bart's normal attacks are doing around 50 damage whereas bolt from Claude and green are doing over 200 so uh it's a no-brainer really. We do have Elemental attached to Claude's weapon with Bolt, but it seems like Bolt itself is just doing enough damage as it is, so no point in attacking. Let's just keep on spamming Bolt until he goes down. I do feel like the Elemental Materia is much better equipped on your armor pieces, mainly because if you are doing physical magic damage to something you might as well just cast the spell unless you've run out of MP, which very rarely happens for Claude because the only magic spells he has are these black magic spells, he doesn't have any healing, but I guess once we get summons it will come in more handy to have the elementals attached to our weapons. But yeah, I didn't really talk too much about this fight because uh, we won fairly easily, we didn't even need any limit breaks or anything like that. And yeah, that is the Midgar section everyone. As the sun sets over the horizon, Claude, Bart, Tofu, Steve and Green ponder the adventure they're about to have as they ask themselves what is Sephiroth's true intentions, what is to become of Shinra 
And who is Steve and her ancestors? Will we ever find out the secrets of the promised land? And will Jamsack hurry up and read out his members so we can get this video done with? And that question can be answered right now as I read out my members. So special thanks to Hugo, Robbie Rose and Jury Lynn who are joining me at my Jamily member stage and my super jams Panas Pusher, Alexander Lazilla, Soul I, Jack B, N and Perseferoth. You guys really keep this channel going and I cannot thank you guys enough for that. Remember if you also want to become a member you can so using the link in my description or just visit my channel and also of course don't forget to like comment subscribe and all that stuff I've already said in the video but that is it for this video. I'm ending it here. Thank you guys so so much for watching. My name's been Jamsack. See you guys next time.